Hello and welcome to Classic 15. I'm Michael Beek. My guest this week is Dr. Indra Viscontis, a trained opera singer and director who also happens to be a neuroscientist. She's an associate psychology professor at the University of San Francisco and is also on the faculty at the city's conservatory. Dr. Viscontis, I'm delighted to meet you. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. You too. It's my pleasure. Love talking about music in the brain. <laughs> so tell me, for those of of the listeners who don't know who you are and what you do, you're a soprano, but you're also a neuroscientist. Uh, which came first? Uh, how do they meet? Do they meet? Yeah, I mean, so soprano came first. Uh, I became interested in neuroscience in high school when I read some books by Oliver Sacks, the great late neurologist. And, you know, I just had a very practical immigrant family that wasn't sure how you make a living <laughs> being an opera singer. So I started out you know, with the neuroscience path, but this was always, you know, I always kept my singing up. I, I you know, was coaching and, and taking lessons in the summers. I was doing summer programs all throughout even my PhD, uh, which I kind of thought of as a way of funding my singing career. <laughs> Um, but I kept the two lives very separate because I didn't I didn't want people to know. I was kind of like a closeted neuroscientist among singers and a closeted singer amongst neuroscientists. Um, and it wasn't until after I had been freelancing as a singer for a while that I was asked to teach a class at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music about how we can use the neuroscience of learning and memory, which was what I did my PhD on, on how to develop more effective practice strategies. And that's when I realized, hey, you know what, if I come out of the closet, so to speak, I actually can help a lot of these musicians make better choices in the practice room. I can validate some of the existing techniques of teaching and also get rid of some of the ones that really aren't that helpful for most singers and musicians. Um, and so that's how I started to bridge the two together. And, you know, since then, you know, there's just been this explosion in interest in this interdisciplinary work uh, between arts and, and sciences, uh, but in particular between music and the brain. Um, so, I, yeah, I feel very fortunate that I was able to sort of start there at the beginning. And, and really, my goal is always really to apply it in, in both directions. So I'm not really interested in understanding music from a scientific framework if I don't see clearly how that's going to make me a better singer or how that's going to make my performance better. And I'm not as interested in sort of like just thinking about kind of music for music's sake, if also I don't see how that, you know, is going to make my life better, make the experience better, et cetera. So, yeah, that's sort of where I am now in, in my work. Um, a lot of my work is about communicating to the general public, in particular to other musicians about what we know about the science, but also just letting the public know how amazing this whole music thing is. <laughs> and yeah, and sometimes like adding a bit of brain science, unfortunately, is one of the things that the, that the, <laughs> that the lay public seems to really think validates the reason why we have music. Totally, totally. And going back to what you were saying about working with uh, people in, in practicing music, what, what were the problems they were having that you were going to go and help them with at that point? Yeah, so especially in, in the classical music world, and especially for classical trained singers, there is this idea that you don't go out on stage until you have mastered your performance until you're perfect because, you know, God forbid you go out there and somebody has a bad impression of you. You never do that in an audition. You never do that on stage. And the problem with that approach is that you never have opportunities to practice performing in front of an audience that matters. And the physical and mental state that, you know, you are in when you are on stage and there's an audience, especially if it's an audience that has some potential power on your future, like an audition panel, it's a completely different environment. And so it doesn't make sense from the brain's perspective to expect that you can do something in a closed practice room the same way that you would do it on that stage. I mean, if, if we know anything about you know, learning and memory, it's that you want the conditions of practice to mimic the conditions of performance as much as possible. And that also brings up this anxiety of, well, we need to be perfect. We need to be perfect. We can't make mistakes. And that doesn't make great art. And it also is really problematic in the practice room if the whole time you're hammering away at trying to aim for perfection rather than expression. 
um, that limits the way in which you approach. Like you think, well, there's just one method and I must do it in that method and I must get this, you know, let's just take something simple as a scale. I have to do it until I get it right. Well, the truth is, is that when you perform any piece, you don't get to perform it 10 times and just have the audience listen to the 10th version, right? You get to do it once. So there's a lot of sort of variability in what you should be bringing into your practice room. There should be much more comfort with taking risks and understanding that growth in the practice room doesn't feel good. It's uncomfortable, but it shouldn't be anxiety inducing. So that, those are the kinds of things that I, I noticed that that especially singers, they weren't really taught how to practice. And if they were, a lot of the advice was just misguided, this idea that just do the same thing over and over and over and over again. And then this sort of whole notion that, you know, the audience wants perfection, that, you know, you can't go out there and, you know, make a mistake and, and how that relates to the performance anxiety. And, and frankly, sort of the fixed mindset that a lot of classically trained musicians uh, begin to develop. Mm. And do you think this really is a, a very specific classical kind of problem? Because classical yeah. music is so bound up in, in, in the bars and the measures and all everything is sort of measured quite literally. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of and, also, and also there's, you know, you're an interpreter of something that's been interpreted by a hundred other musicians. So, you know, on the one hand, you have to bring something different to it, which is hard and needs, you know, requires creativity. On the other hand, there's this long history of how to do it, quote unquote, correctly. <laughs> so I think that that's, you know, that that makes it a little bit more problematic. And I think that's why there's been this kind of grassroots uprising of classical musicians, especially in the younger generations. I was a part of this in, in the opera world to say, you know what, forget that. Like, what if we just sang a bunch of arias in a bar and made it funny, just the way like every other kind of popular musician learns their craft, learns how to, you know, get the audience's attention um, and who cares if you, you know, make a mistake or don't get the right vowel? I mean, that kind of correction you can do later on. You can do, you know, but first you just need to know how to put on a good show. And, and you know, that, that sort of method of just like, in some ways, learning your craft in front of people, <laughs> which is ultimately what you're going to be doing anyway. Exactly. And does that transfer to recording as well? Because, of course, recording is, 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 is just that, isn't it? It's just gain, trying to find that perfect version of the thing you want to record and just doing it again and again until it's the right take. Yeah, and even more so. And I think, you know, recording is its own special beast. And I think a lot of people, a lot of the, the, the I think the very successful recording artists don't try to go for the perfect take. You know what I mean? They try to go for a variety of takes and then they have a palette that they can choose from in order to, you know, craft what it is that they want in that perfect take. But they don't just do the same thing over and over and over again, especially if you're, say, you know, performing with an orchestra. You don't, you don't have the luxury of 10 takes. So what is it that you do uh, uh, to, to make sure that you have something that's going to that's gonna read? And look, we have so many tools now in post-production that we can fix little things here and there. But what we can't fix is, is adding soul. <laughs> There's yet a button <laughs> that we can push that adds soul into the track. And that, of course, is what's going to sell the album. Of course, of course. And the musical brain uh, itself, I mean, is that a thing? I mean, are, are all humans inherently musical or are certain humans better suited, better wired, as it were? So, I mean, I think it, it depends on sort of how you're defining musical, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of, if you, let's say we're talking about music as, um, you know, something that has a number of features, including rhythmicity, including some intent to express, including, you know, some emotional trajectory. Well, then, yes, sure. I would say almost all humans have, you know, of course, there, there, there's a lot of neurodiversity out there, but most of us have rhythmicity in many different aspects of our brains in terms of the way our brain waves oscillate, in terms of the way that, you know, our, our brain and uh, the rest of our body connects with each other. Like rhythm is a part of so much of what our brains do at every level, you know, from individual cells to large swaths of networks. So in that sense, uh, you could also argue that rhythm and those aspects of musicality are what synchronize people together. It's involved in our social interactions. So when I, when I think about early human ancestors and what they might have been doing after they discovered fire, I mean, it was another million years before language came along. So how did they connect with each other? 
probably by exchanging sounds, probably by some kind of rhythm that they're, you know, playing off of each other, looking at each other. And so that to me is musical. That's group music making, you know, at its essence. So yeah, I do think that it's very much ingrained in sort of many different aspects of how our brains function, of how our, our social interactions work. You know, when you think about when you're talking to a baby, you're essentially singing to them, right? You're not really speaking to them. You're giving them a cadence. You're giving them an emotional intent in the way in which you are communicating with them. They don't know the difference between the words, but they can hear the emotion first. Um, so yeah, so I, I think that there's this in, innate musicality in everyone. Now, there are some people who have trouble distinguishing tones, for example, or matching tones. So for them, it might be more challenging to, you know, be a musician or to perform in a choir. Um, there are some people who don't seem to be mu moved by traditional, like by music. They're rare, very rare. Uh, in fact, they're hard to find when you want to study them. And there does seem to be a set of genes that might make a person more likely to develop, say, perfect pitch or absolute pitch or some some other aspects of rhythm or, you know, so there's many genes involved in making music. And of course, some people have more music-like genes than others. But I also think that one of the sort of tragedies of the recording industry and sort of the way that we are able to listen to any kind of music uh, on our phones now is the fact that we've come away from participatory music making. We have this sense that, like, if you're going to make music, it has to be really good because, you know, why would I sing, you know, Adele's Hello if I can just play it on my phone? And the answer is, you know, <laughs> because actually the whole point of, you know, I think why, why our brains are so musical is to make music, um, not just to passively listen. And that's where we see a lot of the benefits. Like, for example, um, I wrote a white paper called Music for Every Child that lays out all of the cognitive, social, emotional, and other benefits of a musical education. And it's like 40 pages long, you know, of all of his executive summaries, of course. Um, so there are a lot of benefits, but those benefits come online when you're making music, not when you're passively listening from six months old. I mean, you know, babies who are six months old and they go into a participatory versus a passive music lesson are better able to read emotional gestures six months later than, you know, the kids who are just sitting around and not participating in the music making. So, so I think that that's kind of one of the things that we've started to come away from. And my hope is that as we start to see the benefits of actually making music, even if it's not perfect, even if it doesn't sound good, even if it's like, it's still good for you in a number of different ways. Just got to have a go and do it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's fun. And I think that there's so many things we can learn from failing at it, too. Sometimes people say, well, you know, I didn't I, I never learned a musical instrument when I was a kid. Now it's just too late. And the answer that I give is that, well, it's never too late because it depends on what your goals are. I mean, if your goals are to be a world-class musician on the stages of these major concert halls, yeah, it's going to be a lot harder for you. <laughs> um, and, and that ship might have sailed. But the process of learning to play a musical instrument, to me, is where the rewards happen. And I think the mistake that people make is they focus too much on the results. You know, I want to be able to play this piece perfectly and it's frustrating because it's taking me so long as opposed to the process. And I and the analogy I give is, is exercising. I mean, if you're only focused on like building muscle or running an eight minute mile or whatever that is, it's not going to be very fun to do all the training. But if you see as that half an hour, 45 minutes or however you have it as, well, this is my time to, you know, focus on my body. It's my time to get my heart rate going. I'm going to enjoy the endorphin rush. Even if it's a little bit painful, that pain is good because it's suggesting that my, you know, some of my muscles are, are strengthening. Then you're more likely to keep doing it and to gain, reap the benefits. And I think learning to play a musical instrument should have the same approach. Um, and that's why the teacher really matters or the type of training really matters because the truth is, is that there's an infinite variety of ways that you can learn to play a musical instrument. You know, we're trying to teach my eight-year-old son now to play piano. We've now gone through like five different sets of books. We've tried Suzuki. We've tried improvisation. You know, 
And there's still more to go. And suddenly he's starting to like to do the things that he didn't like a year ago. And so to me, it's the mistake, again, is when you when you keep doing the same thing, expecting different results, and it stops being fun. I mean, it practicing should be fun. It should be like you know, like creative writing, you know, you sit down and you're imagining and you're you're doing this thing. It should be, I mean, sure, it's work and it requires concentration, but it shouldn't be painful. It's not a root canal. <laughs> but thank you so much for chatting today. It's been absolutely brilliant. Oh, it's my pleasure, Michael. Thanks for having me on. That's all from this edition of Classic 15. Our podcasts are available on all platforms and on our website, www.classic.com, where you can also find Classic's online concert series and other media on demand. And don't forget to check us out on social media too, at Classic Music. Thank you for listening, and until next time, goodbye. <laughs>